Hello and welcome to Farming Matters. Uh, I'm your host, Erin Schneider. I work with the North Central Region SARE program and I also farm in Wisconsin. And I am delighted to be here with you all today. First, to introduce you to our producer and director of the show, Marie Flanagan. Sarah. Hello. And I am delighted that we have a very special guest on our Farming Matters show today, Heather Gayton with Zambria Farms. So as with a lot of our um, videos on this series, we're just here to like celebrate and share the story of like really great projects that are coming out of the SARE program and just kind of learn a little more about the backstory of that and what they learned and what they have to offer. So with that, I'm going to toss it over to Heather and she's going to tell us a little about, bit about her soil and water quality composting design research initiative that was part of a lot of amazing things she does on her farm already. So Heather, welcome. So yes, uh, my farm is called Zambria Artisan Farms, and this particular project uh, was titled Water and Soil Quality Composting Z Design Research Initiative. And this was this is my very first SARE grant where I was able to collect some data and really look at the composting system and how I could integrate composting on my farm. Before we begin, I want to take this moment to do a brief land acknowledgement. Zanbria Artisan Farms is located on lands taken from Ho-Chunk Menominee peoples under pressure from the United States government. The Menominee unwillingly ceded this region to the United States in 1848. Zambria Artisan Farms recognizes this injustice as well as the more than 13,000 years of human history in central Wisconsin. We honor the original residents of this land and those who passed through the Wisconsin River watershed while fleeing war and oppression. We acknowledge that this land was not freely parted with and express our wish to honor those nations that held and still hold this land near to their hearts. This land acknowledgement was uh, provided to me by the Wisconsin Historical Society. And one of the components of this project was as I'm diving into soil health and looking at soil disturbance across the landscape, especially in regions that are uh, part of watersheds where there was travel and trade is looking at those LIDAR images. And uh, I won't spend too much time on that part, but this was a really big core part of implementing a best practice on my farm. So a little bit about me. I have a few professional roles. I am the owner and operator of my own farm. I am also, my off-farm income is outreach program manager for the University of Wisconsin-Madison College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and I am a former, former farmer advocate for conservation with the Nature Conservancy. And uh, so there's some really great educational outreach happening all across these uh, higher ed organizations. I am a community volunteer as well. So I'm the lead farmer for a producer-led watershed group, Farmers of the Roche Cree. I serve on the Adams County Deer Advisory Council, where we look at deer metric data across uh, this particular county. And I'm the secretary for Adams County 4-H. So the humble beginnings of my farm started uh, really right after I was I was diagnosed with a cancer. And I started to inwardly look at what I was putting in my body in terms of nutrition. And it, it started me down this journey as I started managing school garden programming and uh, from my K-12 education background and witnessing the first, witnessing firsthand the healing and transformative powers of permaculture, food resiliency, and education. In my background as an educator and school garden coordinator, I established my farm as a humble roadside garden at a rental property back in 2019. My food as medicine initiative is integral to the foundation of this farmstead. And I came to what is now the 20-acre farm set on the Little Rosha Cree in 2021. It happened to be the same year I was awarded this amazing research opportunity. I am a registered ginseng grower. I license hemp grower. I also grow heirloom specialty crops. And I'm just getting into the food forest living. So looking at what are some native uh, shrubs and uh, fruit and nut bearing shrubs and trees that can be implemented or planted on the farm to increase biodiversity. So here's a little visual timeline of where this project has fit in within the last few years. Uh, so in 2020 is when I acquired this piece of land. I had a big vision, lots of small projects. This is exactly the same part of the land. So it started off as just a little 
uh, off-road logging road turn into uh, what is now my beautiful driveway. And I was able to start establishing some of those bigger projects and getting systems up and going as a beginning farmer. A couple years ago, a couple summers ago, I just I held my first on farm event, which was really exciting and started doing more educational outreach, especially with my work in the producer watershed group. So getting into farming is I knew this was going to be a multi-generational commitment. Uh, whether my son decides he wants to be a part of it or not, that's totally up to him. But I know that having those connections within the community, building relationships uh, across organizations that are doing this incredible work is 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 what it's all about. It's it's as a multi-generational commitment to to honor the history, but also to improve the habitat and improve water, soil, and, and air quality. Initially, I'm sharing this big picture view of my farm, where I started, how it's evolving, and, and this hopefully will give you some context within the particular farm system that I'm going to be talking about later on in the presentation. So how and why did I become interested in this work? Well, not just because that that healing, transformative work around food, but also this relationship with nature and protecting the watershed. There's a lot of development happening in my particular area, uh, a lot of political uh, divisiveness too, and how land should be used and uh, managed. And so this is just one way I could get involved in this work. And, and I got curious and wanted to do more research and explore these systems around soil health improvement and just overall well-being. I believe that ecosystems are worth protecting. They're worth researching and studying. Uh, especially in regards to water, air, and soil quality, which is something that all life depends upon. I, I'm really blessed to be in this particular area. And the longer I'm here, the more rich it becomes in biodiversity. And uh, the Cedar Wildlife Refuge isn't that far from me. So it's really exciting because I'm right on a migratory pathway and I, I'm seeing a lot more of these threatened species flying overhead. And, and that's really exciting to see those populations growing within each year, seeing more uh, diversity across insects and uh, the herbs, the snakes, turtles, lizards, and frogs, and just really making sure that my farm activities are working to complement those other natural systems that are happening in the uh, forested wetland that is around my farm. So how did I get started in composting? Because that's what we're, <laughs> what my project was on, is I start with the basics, okay? So this is one of my very favorite uh, research items that I, I came across, and uh, this is what I started with. So it was just a little small compost, little uh, composting bin that I was doing kitchen scraps, and then I got chickens, and then they start eating my kitchen scraps, and then I was like, well, now I have manure. I got poop. Like, what do I do with this? It's smelly, and but I know I can use it to improve my soil. So that's why I, I started getting into these, looking into this basic system. So here's another aerial view, just to kind of give it where this system is taking place in context of the farm. So you can see the little Rosha Creek is flowing through. The blue box is roughly those 20 acres. The field, uh, seeing as there's a long, thin strip of land there. The yellow heart is where the compost actual like let's say facility it's pretty much just a shed right a composting shed is where I'm managing that that compost and making sure that it's contained and and doing some work there and then the green heart is where the actual like compost is collected so I have a horse and I have chickens and ducks and uh, one rabbit uh, for animals on on the farm and so this strip here is is the field. You can see that in the winter time, in particular, it gets a lot of shade, and in the summertime, it's pretty. It gets full sun. Um, here's the high tunnel. Okay, so I this is where the end product, so the composted manure, ends up back here. The green is this is kind of a, a low spot right here. There's a, a little low spot right here. So I I wanted to keep that manure close to where the facilities are. Okay, so I've got my chicken coop is right there. The uh, horse building is right there. And that's where a, a majority of animals spend a majority of their time. Okay, and so that's the first step that, so when the, that manure is coming out of the animal, it is in that location. 
And this is where, and it just, it helps me manage it. It's far from the, from the water. This there's, it's kind of hard to tell from the aerial view, but these are really steep slopes. Yeah. So it's uh the, the contour of this land. This is pretty high. Um, right here is the 500 year flood mark. And then right in here is the 100 year flood mark right about here. And then this, this will flood, uh, this, this can, this can flood. If we have a, a pretty extreme rain, uh, you can see this is where there used to be one of these, these oxbows. So eventually when this erodes, this Creek is going to fill in this. So this could happen within the next 20 years if we get uh, extreme flooding or more extreme weather weather patterns happening. This creek is constantly changing. This this used to be, the mm -hmm. creek used to flow like through here and it just it continually changes. And then as beavers also come and establish dams, they change that landscape. They're flooding things, which I personally really like having beavers mm -hmm. on the property because they they do. So I had a plan when I was thinking, where am I going to put this? That in the event that this floods right here, that these two stages mm -hmm. are not going to interfere with this water. OK. And so when I had I had Army Corps of Engineers come in and help me design my driveway, we looked at how uh, is that water in the event that a flooding event would happen? What's going to what's going to get washed where where how can I put these things, position these things so that the creek is safeguarded from my activities. Okay. So that was the driving force behind where these things went. Mm -hmm. And so I highly recommend, this is within my context. This isn't going to work for every single other farm. Every farm is unique in their context. You, you, this is where getting in contact with local planning and zoning, looking at those floodplain, that floodplain data, talking to Wisconsin Historical Society to make sure there aren't any Native American burial grounds or other historical sites on your land. These are all, these are, this is all the homework, right? That needs to be done before these systems actually get, you know, integrated. Now, if you come into a farm, like I said, this also has people will purchase a farm that's already has a lot of these buildings and infrastructure that happens. I really, I mean, it, things change over time, other activities could influence the way that your systems function on your farm. So I, I think reaching out to people, those the field technicians, NRCS can be really helpful. Uh, like I said, the local planning and zoning, looking at those floodplains and then Army Corps of Engineers. So those are some of the, re the, the resources that help me plan where I should put these things so that I could utilize the resources on my farm and, you know, while also working within the landscape. So as we uh, talk about these systems, I knew that animal integration, like, so my animals are integrated into the system. They are a part of it. So it's not just for manure, but the chickens, uh, they are released into my high tunnel. So at the very, at the end of the season, the chickens help to break down that residue. They're cleaning up waste. They're preventing weeds from going to seed. The ducks then go in to rehydrate that stressed soil because heat really stresses uh, the high tunnel space. This high tunnel was part of an equip practice that I had uh, received some, some compensation for with them. And so the soils will rest and they will receive the compost amendments and then and also be tested prior to that planting. So we have, when there's a large animal, so I only have one large animal on site and you know, he's just him being there. There's compaction, there's other things going on. So those are some systems, those are some challenges that as I learn how to move him across that through some rotational grazing and maybe even some silvopasture, some other practices that I'm looking into, I'm using, I'm using his manure also as a tool. So you can see uh, right behind Bayo, there is, you see my little wagon there. Uh, then the compost or the manure, the fortunes in the compost is put there. And the chickens scratch around. They help to really break it apart. Saves me a lot of labor. Uh, the biggest labor is just picking it up, you know, staying on top of it, picking it up. But I like a clean space, so that helps. And then, so this is a closer look into what this, what, as it starts to break down. So you see there's some straw in there, some hay, there's some leaves, because where it, where it goes, where that yellow heart was um, in the previous slides, there are, there's a lot of leaf matter. So it's not just manure in, in the green waste. It's, there's a lot of brown waste being added to that as well to balance out those, uh, 
those ratios there. And then as it breaks down, it starts to, you know, if it gets really compacted or really wet, uh, then I, I have to, I just have, I'm constantly monitoring it, adding to it. And depending on where it's going to go and what it's going to be supporting as far as uh, crops, because I grow specialty crops, those crops need different things. So I can add things that make it more acidic. I can, I can adjust my, my recipe, so to speak, for whatever I need on my farm. So a big part of this, is I was really, <clears throat> excuse me, I was really worried about public perception. So anytime that you have, you know, comp, you're, you're working with manure, even if you're composting it, you're doing, you're putting it through these processes that make it safer. Uh, I'm not so much worried about the pathogens, things like that, but I know public perception and people are like, well, what? She's going to manure by the crick, you know, and there was a lot of, I, I was hearing rumblings of that. And I, I think there was a lot of just lack of education. So I knew that I was going to have to have on-farm events to walk people through this so they could see it, they can see what it's like, and, and then ask questions. So the riparian forest buffers, this is something I'm particularly passionate about. This is where establishing those deeply rooted trees, shrubs around spaces that you know, runoff could be a concern. And it's really to prevent those nutrients from going places they shouldn't be going, like the water. And so uh, you can see there are some uh, raspberry bushes and some black caps that are really starting to take in. So this just takes a lot of time. And that's something that I found to be a challenge with grants is like some of these projects where these are systems that are going to take could take a decade to establish, you know, really healthy root systems and these trees. So it's just going to take more time and removing invasive species and doing those other, like buckthorn, for example, to create space that will allow more biodiversity to thrive. So this is where once those soils have been, uh, you know, essentially, I'm going to say created, but you've broken down the manure, created into a compost. Now it's time to add that into the soil Amend in make it a soil amendment and really support biology and they'll stress soil. So here's what it looks like. So the chickens have already been in there, they've been out, those soils have had a chance to rest, they've been hydrated. And now that compost is coming into that system to, to support for the next growing season. Dive into a little closer look. Uh, so here is what it looks like. The, I leave the residue. So anything that the, the chickens haven't eaten, they've kind of broken it apart. It's really great. It, it really helps to uh, break up some compaction. I'm not tilling at all in my high tunnel. And I, I just planted peas uh, a couple days ago. So here's some nice summer pictures. <laughs> so this, the heavy systems are working together. So really that's, that's what the work is all about is how can I manage this manure? How can I create something from it that's going to benefit my farm? It's going to give me data, give me things to really look into, but then also support all these other systems that are working to, to benefit the overall function. And you can see I've got some pollinator habitat out there, the crick, uh, I do have to mow, cut back that reed canary. Reed canary grass is another invasive that I'm dealing with here. It's just takes over. However, once it's it starts to get managed, it's really exciting to see those sedge grasses and some of those those flowers coming in. This particular project focused on uh, so these are kind of the the check boxes that I I continually revisit. Like, are my systems doing these things? And this particular project really covered these, these top three of improved soil health function, improved water, water quality, and it is a regenerative egg practice. I would tell farmers, uh, whatever you are looking to implement on your farm, whatever kind of project or system, you know, it comes back to what brings you joy. And I, I, I asked myself this question, like what, you know, seeing things grow, seeing things thriving, uh, bio, seeing biodiversity uh, brings me joy. Agroecology brings me joy. <laughs> Looking at farm systems and how we can learn from nature and mimic nature and, and create a living ecosystem within the soil, that's, that's exciting to me. Yeah, and my creepy horse Bayo that likes to peek in my windows. He brings me joy too. So here's my farm, my name, my email. Um, people can find me on Facebook, on Instagram, 
I, I look forward to connecting with you and, and growing the network and supporting your systems on your farm. Thank you. Have you noticed improvements or changes in what's happening in your high tunnel based on what's happening mm. on mm -hmm. your post? I have a little story around the high tunnel soil disaster. So it was the same year in 2021. And, and I'll tell you right now, this compost ended up being such a blessing because I had ordered compost. You know, because compost takes time, right? Mm -hmm. It takes time to build it up. It takes time to build up your soil. So I, I, in, I, this is year one, 2021. Okay. And I am, my compost isn't ready yet to put into the high tunnel, right? Cause it's still like, I'm just getting up and going. And I needed compost. I say this because mm. uh, the place that I'd ordered from, it was not compost. It was black sand with mm. weeds and garbage in it. It did not even get filtered or sifted out. Mm. It was a mess. It was a mess. I actually, sadly, I had the first year I had put chickens in there. I had lost half my flock because oh. they ingested oh. glass. <gasps> yeah. And so I was livid. Okay. So this is where I say I... This is exactly why I am making my own soil amendments, because I don't know if I get it from mm. somewhere else, if I buy it from off farm, who knows what's in it? Who knows what chemicals right. are in it? Who knows what's going on? So I say the more you can, if you can build in systems within your farm that you know exactly what is going into that amendment, you know that, you know, you know, you are supporting your land in that way. And you're in your, and you're keeping, I don't have to move my manure somewhere. You know, I used to have to do that when I was mm -hmm. renting, I had to take it somewhere, have a local farmer come pick it up, you know, and it was just, I don't have, I don't have to do that now. And so I think this mm -hmm. is what makes it, it makes it all worthwhile is seeing my animals in a clean pen. Cause I'm out there all the time. Like, Oh, I need more manure. I need more manure. And you know, for my compost, <laughs> so they have clean facilities, right. And they're, they're doing great. They love life. And I'm making this beautiful soil amendment, this gorgeous product that is supporting all of that soil health and improving like biology. And it's just great. That's awesome. What kind of advice would you offer to farmers like navigating a, a SARE grant or like, what has this led to some mm. other things for you or want to speak a little to that or? Yeah, I'd say, and you're not going to get every project you want funded. <laughs> I mean, through grants. I mean, that, that happens, right? <laughs> and it's certain things just click, right? It just clicks and it fits and there's a, you know, there's a lot of interest around it. So it'll, it, you'll get funded. So I, I would say for farmers looking to get into any sort of projects, look at what are the needs, right? We're really, where are the areas that if you had access to, you know, X amount of dollars, that those dollars could be applied to really leverage your project into the next, that next chapter and, and to reach that audience and to engage conversation and, then, and get people thinking around, systems or, you know, whatever it is that the topic is. So that's, I'd say it's just really look at, you know, look at where are the areas that you need support on your farm. And, uh, but then also having that vision of like where you want to go and, and what you want to accomplish as well. And then finding those resources between those two points. Mm -hmm.